I'm the same way you guys are. I can't believe it. Like, probably some of, if not the biggest news we've ever gotten in the college football world happening right in front of us. Rice is going to a bowl, people. Mike Bloomgren took that program over, and in 2018, they had two wins. Then the next year, they had three wins. Then there was the COVID year, which, as I've been told, just doesn't count. Then they had four wins. Then they had five wins. And now they've got six wins. And what we have on our hands is food in a bowl. Also, there are some big hires going on, and we had rivalry week. But I wanted to lead with the juice. Rice, congratulations, guys. Going to a bowl and across town, Houston's got a coaching search underway. We're jam-packed. We're high atop a title ready downtown Nashville, Tennessee. It's conference championship week, but we've got Tuesday to predict the games. Tonight is Sunday, and we fondly look back. It's Sunday night, November 26th, the year of our Lord, 2023. I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan yesterday, and I witnessed Yet another in a long and storied history of Ohio State versus Michigan games. You could argue the last great version or the last classic version of that rivalry as we go to the expanded playoff era and no divisions in the Big Ten and whatnot. What an, at, what an afternoon, what an environment, what an atmosphere. I'll tell you all about it. Also, I've got a ton of other takeaways from rivalry week. You ever watched college football in an airport? You ever seen a big moment? happen in a major airport. I've had that happen a few times over the last few years. Unreal. Texas A&M has a head coach. Mississippi State has a head coach. Many more moves are going on. We've had firings. We've had retentions. I'm going to get to all of it. I've got some very, very early title thoughts. I've got a best bet I love for conference championship week. So we've got a jam-packed show. I know a lot of people have been looking forward to this one, partly because I have to eat some crow. Uh, partly because we were dead on the money on some things and partly just because it was a wild Friday and Saturday and it probably is just getting started. They're watching us in Traverse City, Michigan, Pikeville, Kentucky, Springerville, Arizona, Pauline, South Carolina, and not that I'm into self-promotion. You guys know me well enough to know the last thing I want to promote is myself. However, the Pate State store is popping right now. And I have it on good authority. It is the holiday season. It is the purchasing season. So as you fill those lists out, that, that Christmas sweater that we dropped over at PateStateMaterial.com is beautiful, I have to say. And also, we got a new t-shirt over there as well. So PateStateMaterial.com is, uh, is worth a visit this time of year and any time of year. Here we go. Ohio State falls to Michigan yesterday, 30-24. to 24. Unbelievable environment. I've been to this game three years in a row now. I was up there two years ago when this little mini run of Michigan started, and I was up there again yesterday and saw it continue. I, re- I just really wish you guys could, um, who haven't been to this game, I wish you could experience that. I have told you many, many times. I grew up in the South. I grew up around the Iron Bowl which is its own world, Uh, but I knew Iron Bowl. I only heard about Michigan, Ohio State, and then I've gotten to experience it and blessed enough to stand on the field every year for the past three years for this thing. Just unreal, man. Nothing in the world of sports comes close to when you get to the pinnacle of college football, and this game's the pinnacle of college football. Michigan's the pinnacle of the Big Ten right now. And some of us, I include myself in that, thought we may have a different outcome yesterday, but we did not. What I don't want to do tonight is I don't really want to overthink the room. I, I have a lot of my colleagues, and all due respect to them, who I've seen take uh, minutes to hours to break this game down. And I'm looking at it and I'm saying, well, Michigan outrushed them. 156 to 107. The team that wins the rushing battle is 22 and 0 in this game since 01. Uh, Michigan was plus two turnovers. Teams plus two or better in turnover margin are 7 and 0 in this game since 07. Uh, Michigan, on average, outpunted them 52 yards to 36.7. And I don't have a punting stat for you, but I do want to remind you of this. Remember when the portal went crazy back in the spring? And everyone was talking about the big moves, like DJ Uyunglele going from Clemson to Oregon State. Wow, that's incredible. Well, it was incredible, and it was a really good move for Oregon State. But I thought to myself, wasn't there something Michigan did? And then I remember, producer Jesse helped me out on this earlier today. You remember when James Turner transferred from Louisville? Of course you don't. He's a kicker. But we pointed it out. 
And I mentioned it twice and got chastised a little bit because why are you talking about a kicker? Well, lo and behold, we look at Mr. Turner yesterday, and he goes three of three on field goal attempts. Ohio State was one of two. And you just add these things up. What did it equal? It equaled another Michigan win. This game always has been and always will be about answering and sustaining. Michigan did both. Ohio State kind of did one yesterday. I was standing there, and Michigan got off to the start and got the turnover and went up seven because of it. But even when they were up 17-10 to 10 to start the third quarter, Ohio State goes on this 12-play, 75-yard drive, touchdown. And after they got across the 50, guys, they went run, 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 run. It's kind of like a little microcosm, a little mini version of what Michigan did to close out Penn State. Well, this wasn't to close the game out, but I swear to you, I turned to my left and my right, um, and I said, they're about to take this game over. And they didn't. And you know why they didn't? Because Michigan did the exact thing this game's about. They answered with a seven-play, 75-yard touchdown drive of their own. And they never gave up the lead. Uh, you had, by the way, on that drive, you had a J.J. McCarthy run. His rushing numbers didn't light up the stat sheet. You probably won't have a monster stat game in this sort of game. But he did that. Uh, Loveland had a big catch on that drive. That's the drive where they lose the offensive lineman. Pretty gross injury to see on the field. Um, and then right after that, that place is dead silent. Right after that, Corum rips off touchdown drive or touchdown run. And it's, it's not game over, but as you look back on the game in totality, that's the kind of stuff that decides it. And I always really, I always really draw to that sort of thing because sometimes we get these games that are like pinball games and we look back and so-and-so had 238 yards rushing and so-and-so had 515 yards passing. Well, you're not going to get stat lines like that in this sort of game. The defenses are playing at too high a level, and it's too tight a game. Even if you're playing aggressively, it's a kind of a tight form of aggression. But what you do have is you have these moments, and you have a veteran quarterback finding a way a couple of more times, and you have a first-year starter uh, that is put in a position where he makes mistakes. Not a ton of them, but you got another team that just doesn't make them. Michigan not making mistakes, and Ohio State made a few too many, and Michigan forced them. I don't speak as if they're playing against air. Um, you got a, an opponent that's putting a lot of pressure on you. I've seen a couple of criticisms in the group text that I have with some of my Ohio State buddies. A lot of them I don't agree with. I'll get to the Ryan Day stuff in a second. You know I'm going to address that. But I think Sharon Moore leading in the interim capacity as head coach here, did a phenomenal job, okay? That goes without saying. And that's been the case since this thing started, uh, Penn State, and then last week on the road at Maryland, and then they get this win. But you know what I do agree with? You know the criticism of Ohio State and the praise and credit of Michigan that I do agree with? Uh, Michigan was a more juiced program than Ohio State yesterday. Now look, some of that's theatrical. I don't mean it about Michigan. I mean, when people say that sometimes, it's theatrical. Remember famously now, because it's like a gif that floats around. Remember back when I think it was Southern Cal opened against like Alabama or someone, and there's that scene of them coming out of the tunnel, and they're as juiced and as jacked as you could be, and they get body bagged like 52 to 6. Okay, so some of that stuff's theatrical. I don't mean that. I don't, I don't mean the folks that are yelling the loudest. I don't mean whether you're jawing with someone pregame. But I just mean there's a mentality uh, that you have to have. Uh, people always tell you in warfare, I am clearly separating the two, clearly separating the two. Um, talk to guys who have served before. Guys who have served in active combat situations will tell you, you never really know about a guy. You can go through basic training with him. You never know about a guy until you're either in the foxhole with him or live rounds are flying. Some people go full rat trap. They go into a shell. And others, you see a version of them you, you couldn't have known existed. Well, in football, again, here's the line, clearly separating combat from sports. But in the highest levels of sports, in a different way, it's the same way. There's this certain mentality. There's this trigger that some people have and it's not always the loudest dude in the room. It's not always the team that's the most theatrical. But there's a level that you have to get to collectively to be able to play at the level Michigan does. They did it yesterday. I'm not saying Ohio State fell well short. I'm just saying I got some folks 
Buckeye friends of mine criticizing that. And I was around both these teams yesterday. You have to be because there's one tunnel. I kind of felt that. I, I don't think it's a massive indictment on Ohio State. I think it's a credit to Michigan. But I think there's a lot of validity to that. Um, I also think if you want to tell me, boy, Sharon Moore and that organization with Michigan, they were the aggressor. They kind of took the fight to Ohio State. They felt like they were pushing forward and Ohio State kind of played defensively. I think some of that's overblown, but I think there's some truth to that as well. And those are two things. The reason I bring them up is because those are two things that I've been either seeing or, or outright being told a majority of the day and last night. Yeah, I'd I don't think that's the craziest couple of things in the world to say, but you know, you will hear coaches say organizations win championships. The ones especially who win them, they don't ever say, man, this quarterback won us a title. They say organizations win championships. And that's what Harbaugh's built. He's built an organization there. Ryan Day's got a good one as well. It's just that Jim Harbaugh's is better right now. Michigan's is better right now. The entire evidence of that is you can have the leader of said organization, as I've said many times over the past few weeks, forcibly have his hands removed from the wheel. Car keeps right on. Uh, that's a rock-solid organization. And back in, what was it, summer, when we were at Big Ten Media Days, we were around both these teams. I was really impressed with the vibe Ohio State gave off. There's only so much you can learn about a football team when the dudes are wearing suits. I'll grant you that. But there was a vibe. The talk was right. And then Michigan came through at Big Ten Media Days. And I remember talking to some of our colleagues there, and I said, you know, these guys off the record, they keep talking about how they're the best team in the Big Ten. Now it's about winning playoff games. And I, I got Ohio State folks talking to me about how it's about beating Michigan and getting back to, you know, where we think we're supposed to be. And that juxtaposition kind of struck me because I thought to myself, man, the, the competitive audacity, the calculated audacity, if you will, uh, the competitive arrogance to look at Ohio State as almost being in your rear view. It's not that we've pulled even with them. We're past them. We respect them as, as worthy competitors, but we're past them. We got Ohio State back here, and now we're looking out here. How do we win playoff games? How do we win a national championship? And they were valid to think that way, as it turns out. Their program hadn't taken a step back. If anything, it's taken a step forward. So now Michigan's about to go to the Big Ten championship game where they are favored by over three touchdowns against Iowa. And that's the last time you'll ever say something like that because it's the last time the format of the Big Ten championship game will ever be this way. So major all caps congratulations to Michigan and to that entire coaching staff. Now you get Harbaugh back starting this week for the conference championship game. But as much as was made of what Michigan's done, uh, man, dude, the, the, the pressure on Ryan Day was immense. You cannot go into these sorts of games and put the stakes on them that we had on this one and not have someone's life be miserable. It's the beautiful thing about sports if you're on the outside of the snow globe, if you're on the inside of it and you end up on the wrong end of it, I, mm, it's a lot of money. I know it's a lot of money. I know that. I've always, anytime someone tells me, oh man, I'd be miserable, I, I'd work all those hours for that kind of money, I don't doubt you would. You're probably not qualified to, but if someone offered you, uh, what does a day make, seven or eight million dollars? I don't know, it makes a lot of money. Let's just say eight. If someone offered you eight, nine million dollars a year, I know you'd sign the piece of paper. Uh, the, the whole point in the way that competitors are wired, high-level competitors, is that's not the motivation to begin with. And I don't mean they don't love making the money. Certainly, they love making the money. But it's not what drives a lot of them. And therefore, all I'm telling you is he can make $9 million or $9 billion a year. If you're a competitor and, and you're, your wiring is of that nature, there is no amount of money you can make that eases the sting of, I just lost to Michigan three straight years, and you can't do that as the head coach here. No amount of it, okay? So the reason I say that is because that same group text included a lot of folks either saying one of two things. He makes this many millions of dollars a year, so this is unacceptable, or he makes this many millions of dollars a year, so I don't feel sorry for him. Well, no one's asking you to feel sorry for him, me included. Uh, but all I'm saying is there was a third component to it, and that is 
he makes this many millions of dollars a year, so it sucks for me a lot more than it does for him because I'm just a fan working a nine-to-five job. You may be a fan working a nine-to-five job. I got all the respect in the world for you. It doesn't suck worse for you than it does for him. Promise you. I, I wish that I could have a psychological profile, not just on Ryan Day, on any of these coaches. You can do it with Kirby. You can do it with Saban. You can do it with any of these guys. If Sark uh, were to lose this Saturday, I think that's when the Big 12 championship game is, I wish you could do a psychological profile in the moment and realize how little they care about their salary in the moment. It's nice to have the money. But, man, for high-level competitors – this is everything. The real currency is winning. And when you don't do it, it just doesn't matter. You're, you're too miserable to spend your money anyway. So moving forward, there's going to be an unhealthy conversation around Ryan Day. A blind man could have seen that coming. He is 56 and 7 as a head coach. But he's, and I'm going to say it before everyone else says it, he's 1 and 3 versus Michigan. He's 1 and 3 in the college football playoff. The other loss came against Oregon randomly a few years ago. He's, he's, something like 40 or 41 and 0 versus the rest of the teams. And an Ohio State fan will tell you readily and accurately, we should win the rest of those games. You're going to be judged on a few games per year here, most notably this one. And if you don't win it, uh, we'll move on. I'll give you my personal opinion on it. My personal opinion is I love the value that's placed on this game. I love the importance of it. I love the magnitude that it carries. It is what's beautiful about regular season college football in a pre-expanded playoff era. It's what I've grown up with. I love the maximization of importance on Saturdays in the fall. Where I do think people get it wrong sometimes, humbly, is I think far too much finality is placed on the result of this one game. And I think far too much value is placed on the result of this one game as it relates to how good a coach is. But at the same time, I understand. I think Ryan Day coached a good enough game yesterday, for example. I think offensively, I had a couple of coaches texting me saying, it's pretty impressive what they did offensively, given the limitations of quarterback yesterday. I know you guys don't want to hear that, uh, but I think they coached a good enough game to win yesterday. They turned the ball over twice. Michigan didn't. That's kind of the way it works. I just, I don't watch them lose the game for the third time in a row and make these holistic, overarching, definitive conclusions about the guy. Whereas if the turnover margin would have been inverted, you'd be saying, good for him for hiring Jim Knowles a couple of years ago. Hey, good for Ohio State for matching the physicality at the line of scrimmage. Hey, hey, good for Ohio State for this, for that. It's like the same game plays out. You change one little stat column and it's, it doesn't make the person any different. And so the one thing I'm curious about is, does he feel that wholesale changes are needed? I doubt he does. I do think that what's interesting is, what is a Ryan Day team? And I ask the question because this Ryan Day team looks different than what a Ryan Day team did two years ago. And two years ago, uh, inevitably, they were going to have a Heisman caliber quarterback pulling the trigger, but they weren't, they weren't anything special defensively. Well, now they are because a Ryan Day program decided they needed to be, and they made the move. Well, what is a Ryan Day team two years from now, four years from now, if he's there 10 years from now? That, that's what fascinates me because I don't know the answer because I don't think the dude's done evolving as a head coach. Uh, this one will sting. It should. You can't be losing three games in a row to Michigan if you're the head coach at Ohio State. He gets that. Everybody, I think, gets that. Uh, but at the same time, to go back to the group text again, because I thought it was a perfect case study for doing the segment tonight, I'll ask them and I'll ask you guys the same question. The ones who actually think you need to move on from this guy, where are you going? Now, I don't think serious-minded people you know, in the Woody Hayes facility up there, think that way. But if you do, where would you go? I want you to also just, just consider something. I'm going to talk about this later in the A&M segment. The Grand Slam hire in college football is largely an illusion. Bama pulled it off a generation ago with Nick Saban. Elsewhere, where are the Grand Slam hires? And what I mean is, the championship caliber coach already established as such and then importing him into your program. Where does that happen? So, so what I'm trying to tell you is it doesn't. You think in your mind it does because you think, what about, what about Dabo at Clemson? That dude wasn't anything before they elevated him and took a chance on him. And you can say the same thing about Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma. You can say it about Day at Ohio State. You said it about Kirby at Georgia. Even if you were to get rid of him, your best case scenario is you're taking another risk. 
Uh, the Ryan Day risk has been a lot more reward than downside, but the downside's magnified, and I get it. I just think there's a lot further you could fall than you could climb right now. Michigan could very well win the national championship, though. And I haven't said that in the last two years. Uh, this team could win the national championship. I, I, th there are limitations offensively, but they are a complementary team. They're a player-led team. And you saw when the offensive lineman went down yesterday, it wasn't, like taking, it wasn't like taking a brick out of the wall. It was like scooping a cup of water out of a lake. The rest of the water just filled in. That's the difference. And trust me, there's a big one. Some, some teams are player-reliant and Michigan has an organization. It didn't happen overnight either, but they got an organization. So that was fun yesterday, man. The big house uh, on fire. I've been there two times, and it was for the Ohio State game both times, and it was freezing. By my standards, it was freezing. I grew up in West Central Georgia. Uh, a lot of you guys, man, in the student section never put on a shirt yesterday. And uh, if, if you think that I'm soft for being impressed by that, I'm soft because I'm impressed by it. And the redness of the skin by halftime, much less the fourth quarter, was um, noticeable from a long way away. But, oh, what an environment. I had a couple of buddies who went up there for the first time from the South and experienced that yesterday. I'll be excited to get their feedback. Amazing, amazing game. So where are we going this week? This week's conference championship week, so we don't have as big a slate to choose from. Uh, but we have made a decision. However, there's going to be a little... There's going to be a little caveat, a little asterisk next to what I'm about to tell you. So I'm going to go ahead and um, say hello to the live chat because you got a lot of guys in there. I am going to Atlanta with the Once Upon a Saturday Tour this Saturday for the SEC championship game. Alabama versus Georgia. I grew up uh, right on the border of these two states. The Chattahoochee River is the border. As I tell you guys that are from elsewhere, it's not just an Alan Jackson song. It's a real thing. It's a real river, and it is the state line between Alabama and Georgia. I got my first break in this business doing sports talk radio in Columbus, Georgia, and that was 2012, and that was the year that these two met in the SEC championship game. And uh, it was then that I realized, yeah, Bama's big rival is Auburn, and, and Georgia's big rival is Florida, but there is never the kind of electricity in this market or the Atlanta market, or the Birmingham market, than when these two play each other, and they play each other with championship hopes on the line both ways. I've got several theories as to why that is. Folks will argue with me about it. They're wrong. I'm right. I'm telling you, I see our numbers when we do it now. I see our numbers when they play now. Special. Really special. I was, I was there front and center when the Tua to Devante a uh, play happened. I was there a couple of years ago when Bama beat him in Atlanta and then up in Indianapolis when Georgia beat them for the title. It, it's its own story. And we get another chapter of it this Saturday. The Once Upon a Saturday tour has been amazing this year. We've had, we've had Gelby on the road all year, who has now changed his name to Gelby on uh, Twitter, I see. We've had Coach Quinn on the road all year. Just, just major league salute to her. Um, very, very professional and that's something you don't take for granted if you've ever worked without it and then you work with professionalism it's a game changer trust me a lot of you have seen Gelby and Quinn on the road uh, some of you have even wisened up to being able to know who they are and asking them for pictures with them which I highly encourage by the way I probably don't take enough pictures with them so I encourage you to but the reason I told you there may be little asterisks next to that is not because this game is tainted in any way I was I was looking around, and I was, I was gazing upon the conference championship game slate this Saturday, and I said, these games aren't all happening on Saturday, are they? Got some games on Friday. One really big one on Friday out in the desert. So, um, I don't know. Just stay tuned. You never know. Air travel's a fascinating thing these days. You never know where we could pop up. Speaking of Alabama got to take a sip from the chalice before this. I had such an interesting experience with the Iron Bowl, even though I wasn't there yesterday. And mind you, we've, we've got A&M hiring a coach. Uh, we got breaking, we got news breaking on the coaching hiring front all over the place. So we got a loaded show. I mean, I'm just now scratching the surface of it. Bama won the Iron Bowl yesterday, which is shocking because they tried 47 different ways not to win the Iron Bowl yesterday. And yet 27 to 24 was the final. 
You know, last week, we were coming at this very point off the heels of Auburn falling to New Mexico State. And I looked at it, and, and we had a little fun with it, as did most of the college football public. But then we got to Monday and Tuesday, and I started to notice Bama fans aren't stupid. They know the history of this rivalry. They know the history of them having to go play at Jordan-Hare Stadium. And so I took to the socials, and I tweeted the following. I said, um, yeah, 31 to 10, New Mexico State over Auburn. It's, it's humiliating. It's degrading. But I said, quote, the best part about Iron Bowl history at Jordan-Hare is how Bama fans instantly knew to be worried when New Mexico State blew Auburn out last week. This is not an I told you so moment. I mean, I kind of did there, but I, I thought Bama was going to run away with the game. So I didn't get the result I expected at all. However, there was no shock on my face whatsoever when this went down. Uh, the thing that went down was unbelievable. In fact, I'll tell you about my experience in a second. Let's just talk about what went down here. There is a, a tough lesson learned by Hugh Freeze. Scratch that. Freeze knows the lesson. It was a tough lesson learned by the players on that Auburn team. A lot of new folks in the Auburn program. A lot of folks facing Alabama for the first time. And the lesson is this. You got to cut the head off the snake. You can't run over it. You can't just step on it. You've got to take an ax and you got to cut the head off the snake. Because if you don't, it will bite you even though you think it is dead and buried and gone. Bama's the snake. And yet again, someone ran over him a couple of times and said, all right, well, that takes care of that. So many chances for Auburn. So many percentage chances that look like 90%, 95%, 97%. ESPN's got that thing that is probably powered by the same machine that powers FPI, so I don't put a whole lot of stock into it. But you had the ESPN machine saying at one point, Bama had a 0.1% chance to win the game yesterday. I actually don't think that's too far off. But you know what we got? Instead of an Auburn win, what we got is a Sarah McLaughlin special. It's not even a stat. What we got is we had a situation, and I'm watching this in an airport, mind you. Uh, we had a situation where fourth quarter, fourth and goal, you got everybody back. They're 31 yards from the end zone. This is the part where Auburn only rushes two guys. They spy uh, Milrow inexplicably, even though he's got half a mile to run to get a touchdown. And there's Isaiah Bond. Back of the end zone, touchdown. It gets no more Sarah McLaughlin special than that. They might as well have played it on that very, very expensive PA system and video board they have. I couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. And now let me tell you where I watched this game. Okay, our, our CBS crew's there. Big game, Jenny Dell's on the sideline. We got Brad and Gary in the booth. I am about a thousand miles away, and I am in the Detroit airport. And I got to tell you, friends, I know when college football games are going on on Saturdays, most of you are parked in front of a TV or you're in a stadium. But we're on the road every week, and fingers crossed, my game normally happens at noon if I get my way. And sure enough, Michigan-Ohio State happens at noon yesterday. So we do our post game once the field clears. And then we hightail it to Detroit. Not a bad drive yesterday. And we get in the airport. And if you've never witnessed a major college football Saturday and a big college football moment in a, in a large, like, international airport, it's a sight to behold. College football is a massive game in this country. Massive. And it's never on display more readily than if you're in a major airport as a major college football moment happens. So here's the scene. Detroit's airport is just this one, like, 10-mile-long terminal, it seems. And so you can see, as far as the eye can see, all the way down the corridor, you can see just pockets of people. And it looks like they're waiting for bags, but they're not. They're crowded around restaurants, and they're too cheap to buy anything. I was one of them. And they're watching TVs from out in the regular concourse. So let me set the scene for you. It's fourth and goal from the 31-yard line yesterday, and everyone is glued in Detroit, Michigan, to a television as, as best they can get their eyes on. And when that play happened, there was one TV, like way down several gates, that apparently was a little ahead of the other TVs. And so this massive commotion just echoes down the corridor in the terminal, 
And then about five seconds later, Milrow lets go of that ball. Isaiah Bond catches it in the back of the end zone. And you would have thought the Red Wings either won the Stanley Cup or lost the Stanley Cup on like an overtime shootout goal. That's what it sounded like in Detroit's airport. Could you imagine being in Shuttlesworth or Hartsfield or somewhere in the South when that happened? Uh, Insane. And uh, temporarily, you know, you start seeing folks high five strangers and then you start seeing other people slump their shoulders and their head, even though they're wearing like Michigan gear. And what are you, what are you mad for? Well, I don't know. I just hate Bama. And then you got another guy who is sitting there oblivious to it all. He's probably from France and he's connecting in Detroit, flying to Tucson to see his daughter graduate or something like that. And he's like, oh, this is not even football. It's amazing. Amazing to see a major college football play or ending go down in an airport. Auburn had success running the ball against Alabama. And I know when you look at the box score and you see Auburn ran it 42 times for 244 yards and two scores, you think, wow, Bama's vulnerable. That's not good at all, which it's not. But you know which game it reminded me of? It reminded me of when Auburn ran it 43 times for 219 and two scores on Georgia. The two best teams they faced, they ran it for over two bills on each of them. And it's almost like Hugh Freeze knows a thing or two. And he's, he's working with bubble gum and paper clips for a roster down there right now. So they're not looking for a moral victory, and I'm not even here to grant them one. I'm just saying those two teams, Bama and Georgia, play each other this Saturday. And um, Auburn ran it on both of them. It's pretty interesting. Just tuck that away. But as soon as this game ended, people who know college football watched this ending, and they said, Man, you got to cut the head off the snake. You can't let Bama stay alive. And then other people said, wow, what an ending. And they just appreciated it for what it was. But then you had a sizable majority say, this Bama team's got no shot against Georgia. Well, you're probably right about that. Here's the follow-up. That Bama team's not playing Georgia. That's the follow-up. You know, Georgia's team last night that faced Georgia Tech, that's not the team that'll play Alabama either. If you've... I start to say if you've watched college football long enough, you should know better. But I got folks way older than me that say this stuff sometimes. And so I don't know. I I don't think it's utter stupidity. I'm not going to be one to say that. I will just repeat the words of Meemaw. Smart people do say casual things sometimes. Casual people rarely say smart things. So for all I know, many of you are geniuses, genii, the plural. And you just maybe don't possess the ability to understand week to week, the performance level you get from teams in college changes radically. You want evidence? The same things that led to Auburn losing handedly to New Mexico State, but then taking Bama to the wire are the same sorts of things that could see Bama taken to the wire in a game they should lose one week and then possibly go beat Georgia in Atlanta the next week. Stuff happens all the time happens all the time. Think about two years ago. Uh, we got an SEC championship game featuring these same two teams, and Bama's got no run game to speak of, and no one ever beats Georgia being one-dimensional. And I sat here, we were in the other studio, but I sat here in the greater Nashville area, and I said, Colin, I hardly ever pick against Bama because they hardly ever lose. I don't really see a way they're going to win this game. And so I took Georgia, I laid the points, and I was confident. And Bama goes in there, beats them by like two touchdowns, And I'm saying, how did this happen? Well, it happened because Alabama's built to beat Georgia and Georgia's built to beat Bama. They are built to beat each other. They mirror each other. Half the staffs worked previously for the other staff. They know each other as well as they know themselves. It is a one-game season. You may, for all you know, be watching the two best in the country Saturday. And, And you look at it and you say, well, there's no way. There's no way. Because look, respectively, they just won games by one possession this past weekend. I don't know what to tell you. I have a sneaking suspicion, and it's just a suspicion. Had the SEC championship game been played yesterday in the minds of those players, maybe you see three or four touchdown wins either way. I don't know. Maybe you do. I'm just telling you, I don't watch the Iron Bowl outcome yesterday nor do I watch Georgia Tech and Georgia and Georgia. You kind of look kind of lethargic a little bit. I couldn't care less. I care that they win because it, you know, crystallizes the importance of the game coming up. Uh, Going to be a war in Atlanta Saturday. 
But as for Auburn, man, um, nothing changes. Nothing really changes about the game. Look, if Auburn would have won the game, yeah, it's, it's great for recruiting. It doesn't really change the caliber of the program. It doesn't change what I think Hugh Freeze can do. It was good that they had recruits there to witness the environment. It was good because as soon as you do that, as a coaching staff, you get to look those kids in the eye and say, look how close we just came. Now imagine what we could be if we had you. It's a pitch as old as time, but it works if the right staff is pitching it. I got a text earlier today from our friends at Academy Sports and Outdoors, and I think I may get to see them in Atlanta Saturday, and um, it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, we've been running a con- they've been running a contest. We've just been participating where they give away a $10,000 Academy gift card and two tickets to the SEC championship game. Now, I selfishly, and I'm thinking about you guys, not me, so selfishly, I've been hoping some of you win that, and I'm checking to see whom's won, not that we're going to reveal identities, but... Look, some of our audience would want their identities revealed, so stand by on that. In the meantime, you guys getting ready to tailgate for conference championship week, or maybe your team's not in a conference title game, and you plan on grilling out, or you want to camp, or you want to go fishing, or I don't know what you want to do. Buy a, an early Christmas present, basketball hoop, put it in the driveway. They got it all at Academy Sports and Outdoors. They are your one-stop shop for outdoor sporting goods supplies plus, and they bring this show to you free of charge, and they are our everlasting partner and we appreciate it so academy sports and outdoors always has our back and they got your back as well unbelievable turn of events happening in college station unbelievable i've said that word a lot tonight but that's kind of how you have to describe our sport sometimes i would say that i would say the chalice has some maroon liquid so ceremonially we're going to use two hands for this immunity texas a&m has hired a head coach So let us take, out of the chalice of supremacy, a ceremonial chug of maroon-colored liquid. This is like white smoke at the Vatican. They have hired a new head coach at Texas A&M. And it's Mike Elko, head coach at Duke, formerly of Texas A&M. 24 hours ago, though, it was Mark Stoops. Stoops was signed. Actually, he wasn't. He was just kind kind of delivered, and the signed and sealed was in the process of happening And then Texas A&M flexed a little bit, not the administration, the fan base. And they got that thing overturned. The iJosh was burning up last night. I had a lot of people in that part of the country telling me how much disdain they had once they started learning that Mark Stoops was going to be the head coach of Texas A&M. And I told them, well, if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. Like, I think Stoops is a good coach. I think he'd do fine there. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, it's not my business. It's your business. Well, then everybody felt that way. And it was, it was, according to you guys, it was not nearly to the degree of animus that ten, Tennessee fans uh, displayed when they thought they were going to hire Greg Schiano. But it felt the same to me because in the span of a few hours, it went from Mark Stoops is going to be the head coach at A&M to Stoops is staying at Kentucky. You guys got that overturned just like Tennessee fans did back in the day. Now, they went on to hire Jeremy Pruitt, and it torpedoed their program. You went on to hire Mike Elko a day later, and the results are to be determined here. I think Mike Elko is going to be okay, though. I like Elko as a hire more than Mark Stoops, and I would have been fine with Mark Stoops. Um, You haven't had a high-level CEO running Texas A&M football in quite a while. And if I don't know anything else about Elko, I know you got one in him. And you may think to yourself, well, how can you say that about Jimbo Fisher? I mean, isn't the head coach, the CEO of the program? Well, he's supposed to be. It just, it was never a comfort zone. It was never the way that anyone around Jimbo Fisher would describe him. In fact, they would describe, they would actually quite the opposite. They'd describe him as unorganized. Uh, They would describe him as a guy who needed a CEO type around him because he wasn't that. Everyone has strengths and weaknesses. This is not bang on Jimbo Fisher night. I'm just saying, if you want to, If you want to correct course and you want to fill in the blanks that were not filled in previously, that's how you do it. You go find a guy who who knows your program because he was there, and therefore he knows some of the I's that need to be dotted and T's that need to be crossed. But also, if you didn't have a CEO type and there was just there were some loose ends here and there that end up being the difference in one possession games on fields on Saturdays, 
Go get a guy who does fit that description. And Mike Elko does. And you know what else? He's a really good football coach. And I would challenge you to find anyone who suggests otherwise. Uh, I've had some points of contention on this. Not many. Now, I'll grant you, most A&M fans seem to like this hire. I've actually had more people from the outside uh, talk about how they don't think it's flashy enough. And to that, I just say, that's not a serious football-related point. I could. I just don't care. Uh, flash wins nothing. Fl- I'll give you an example. You know who made a flashy, splashy hire recently? USC did. USC is sitting at home nowhere close to the Pac-12 championship game this weekend. Now, that may change in the future, but USC won the press conference. You, they got a ton of coverage on this show. You go and take Lincoln Riley from Oklahoma, and he's your head coach. Man, that's, that's the old Grand Slam. That's the fabled Grand Slam hire I'm about to talk about in a second. Well, what did it get you? So had USC hired Mike Elko, oh, it would have been slammed. This isn't, this isn't Southern California. This isn't Los Angeles. You got you to gotta make a splash. You got to resonate. No, you got to win. That's what you have to do. Winning cures everything. Well, you got to have a fit, don't you, Josh? Yeah. The right way to fit at Texas A&M or USC or anywhere else is win. Don't care if you've ever worn cowboy boots before. Don't care what your accent is. I care that you understand how to build and sustain an organization. I care that you understand how to acquire and develop talent. I want to know that you understand how to run a major program and deal with a lot of the off the fields that come with that. I want to know that you're structured. I want to know that you get how to promote and market properly and not just say, oh, let's do some social media stuff. And I want to know that you can hire a high level staff and have a singular vision. That's what fit is at Texas A&M or anywhere else. Second thing that I've been asked sarcastically by a lot of people, I've been asked by a lot of people, well, now that they hired Elko and it was him after Stoops blew up, those aren't A-list tier one kind of names. You must have been wrong in your assertion that this is a tier one job. Well, hey, I could be wrong about it. But if you're asking me if I think this proves my opinion wrong, uh, blank, no, it doesn't. Look at me self-censoring. No, it doesn't. No, I think everything I thought about the value of the A&M job. It's just I think you're chasing a unicorn when you imagine what a tier one job being open is actually like. I think Georgia's one. I think Ohio State's one. I think Oklahoma's one. I I do think A&M is one. I mentioned those programs because let me ask you something. They've all hired coaches semi-recently. Where were the Grand Slam hires? The Grand Slam doesn't happen. The Grand Slam hire doesn't happen. In other words, the move that you think a tier one program should be able to go out there and make happen actually doesn't happen. In other words, I had folks thinking, well, unless they go pry Ryan Day away or or Dabo Swinney, that's proof that this really isn't the job that Josh made it out to be. No, nobody does that. No job, when it comes open, does that. You start, you start calling BS on me here. I'm going to ask you, list the Grand Slam hires. And by Grand Slam, I mean a program that went and got an already established championship caliber coach to come to their program. List them. You got Bama a decade and a half ago. They got Nick Saban. Keep listing them. Keep going. Don't, don't give me Kirby Smart. Dude had never been a head coach a day in his life when Georgia hired him. Don't give me Lincoln at Oklahoma. Ditto. Don't give me Lincoln at USC because he hadn't done anything there. Dan Lanning, never been a head coach when Oregon went and hired him. They're all taking chances. These aren't Grand Slam hires. What about Dabo? What about Dabo? Dabo had never even been a coordinator at Clemson before they elevated him. Keep going. Steve Sarkeesian could be in the playoff. Sark had been a head coach that failed multiple times and had to beg for a job as an off-field guy at Alabama, to even get back in, in, in any kind of standing that would get him a job down the road. Where are the Grand Slam hires? These are high-level programs I'm listing. Oklahoma just had one. They went and hired Brent Venables. Brent Venables isn't a Grand Slam hire. Your hope is that they end up being Grand Slam coaches. My point is, I remember when these guys were hired. I remember all the list of the dream candidates, and they didn't come true because the Grand Slam hire doesn't happen as you define it. 
What you have to do is you have to have your critical traits and factors clearly listed. You have to have a very keen eye in understanding what makes a quality head coach and what separates that from, you know, what just makes a good coordinator. And, and you got to have really good structure. You could argue they haven't had those things in the past at Texas A&M, but I will stand by every word I said. The things that it takes to win, A&M doesn't lack any of them. They may have once upon a time. They don't now. It's just there is no such thing. Outside of LSU getting Brian Kelly, I will grant you that that's a Grand Slam hire if you define Grand Slam by getting a guy who has a championship caliber past. He didn't win a title at Notre Dame, but he had them at a consistently high level. I will grant you, if you want to tell me Michigan landing Jim Harbaugh was a Grand Slam, I will grant you that they went to the NFL to get him. And he's a Michigan guy, so there was kind of a unique inroad there. Outside of that, where are they? It's Nick Saban. That's who it is. Alabama pulled it off, and then everyone started to think, oh, that's what we'll do if our tier one job comes open. That's not the way it works. It's not, I know you think you dunked on me with that one. This is not the flex you think it is. And so they're hiring Mike Elko, and um, I think he'll do good there. For all I know, he will be a Grand Slam hire. It's just that if he is... You won't know immediately. You won't know. I, I was listening, like, like, for example, I texted Lucci a little while ago. I was listening to Billy Lucci and uh, the folks over at Texax talk about this earlier today. And I kind of thought about that, and I, I, I extrapolated a little bit further. Man, they're right. Like, Ryan Day, a lot of Texas A&M fans thought, we may go after him. You, you weren't going to get Ryan Day. You, like, you weren't going to get Dabo Swinney. And the reason those guys weren't in play is not because you don't have a good job. It's because in college football... Guys don't leave tier ones for other tier ones. Lincoln Riley is the exception to the rule, and he may have made a catastrophic error in judgment. And, and Oklahoma is doing pretty okay without him. Um, so congratulations to Mike Elko. Congratulations to you guys who have a head coach now. I'll be excited to hear that press conference. Excited. I, I look, Mike Elko's not a win-the-press-conference guy. I think he'll win the press conference too, though, so I think it'll be, um, I think it'll be all thumbs up out there. I've got more games to get to. I've got a lot more coaching intel. We've got other hires to talk about, so we gotta, we got to roll. Florida State won last night, and they were down, and I thought they were out. 24-15 to 15 ended up being the final. Um, I think a ton of folks are pulling against Florida State right now. And now, I've got people coming at me thinking I'm one of them. Whatever. Think what you want to. I do think there's validity in, a, in suggesting that a lot of America is pulling against Florida State right now. I'm just here to tell you, you're right about that. They don't think that you can compete in the playoff. They think you'll get blown out in the playoff. I would make you a double-digit underdog myself against a number of teams that theoretically may be in the playoff. Um, that's why they're pulling against you. They're pulling against you for the same reasons they pulled against TCU last year. That is true, and it doesn't matter. And you shouldn't really care about it all that much because you're one win away from being in the playoffs yourself. Cannell's right about this. You freeze that statement in time because it rarely comes out of my mouth. But Cannell's right about this. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I said it before he did. But look, I'll give Cannell his flowers. He's right about this. All they have to do is win. They got to beat Louisville. And they're in the college football playoff. And if they're not, it would be a travesty. I've already given you my whole take on most deserving versus best. I don't ever think the committee, by the way, meant to say, we're going to put the four best teams in regardless of anything else. Because that's just power ratings. Okay, no sport works like that. Nor, nor should any sport work like that. Because that does not value on-field results. Games are played on a field, not on paper. And so what the committee, I think, should come out and say is, well, we're going to blend things. Yeah, we're going to value who we think the best teams are. But we're also going to heavily value on-field results, head-to-head. -head. Like, we're going to value all these things in a blender where you can't have people come to you at the end of the season and say, Florida State shouldn't be in over Alabama because Bama would be a 10.5 point favorite against them. If you think Bama should be in, you better have a different reason than that. It better be resume-based. And then I'll listen to you. Maybe even if I don't agree with you, I'll listen to you. But Florida State's got one more win and they're in this thing, or else we'll have a whole show dedicated to one of the biggest screw jobs in the history of college football if they get left out. They trailed 12 to nothing in this game yesterday. I was watching it as I was, as I was flying home. I, I would have swore to you, this is it. They're done. I picked Florida to win the game. I felt confident. I felt confident there. And then 
They held Florida to 48 yards. Should we paper pop this? That's a paper popper of a stat. They held Florida to 48 yards in the second half, and then double paper pop here. They held Florida to minus 15 yards in the fourth quarter, and Florida helped them out, but Florida State took advantage. Florida's such an undisciplined team, man. It's so disappointing. I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. We talk about winners first here. Florida outgained Florida State. It didn't matter. Neither team more than 235 yards. It was always going to be that kind of game. Even if Florida State won this thing, they were going to have to win ugly just because of the circumstances they were in with the backup quarterback on the road. They won the fourth quarter 10 to nothing. That's probably the padlock stat here. They, you know what they needed to do? Just not lose the game, which sounds really easy and basic but it's kind of like in week one you know in week one in college if you don't have a preseason coaches will always tell you hey far more games are lost than they are won in week one and what they're saying is kids are mistake prone and sometimes even if you don't play with your hair on fire and play your best game if you just don't make the critical mistakes chances are your opponent will and if you're playing Florida doubly especially chances are they will and they did and Florida State just said, uh, we'll take it. Keep, keep doing it. We'll take it. Trey Benson, while he didn't have, you know, a, a Heisman-worthy monster stat line here, 19 carries for 95 yards and three touchdowns, you've seen games like that in a box score. This was a monster performance. Again, given the circumstances, that's a big boy performance from Trey Benson, and it deserves to be commended because there were a lot of things Florida State couldn't do last night, and that was one thing they did do. And so now they are going to Charlotte. I believe that's where that game's played. They opened as a four-and-a-half-point favorite against Louisville, who beat, got, or got beat by Kentucky yesterday. It, it's all there, that they don't need help. As far as I'm concerned, they don't need anything else other than to take care of what they control, and that is win, and I believe if they win, they're in. Florida's got issues, man. Florida, what aggravates me most about watching Florida is they are not as a program what I think Billy Napier is as a coach. And that's not a good thing to be saying. If you're more than one year in, that's not a good thing to be saying. They are undisciplined. Now they're inconsistent. There are facets of that team that were a problem in week one and were still a problem last night. And they're chronic in nature. And it's disappointing because I don't think that's who Napier is as a coach. But if your, if your program does not reflect a thumbprint of who you are, that's because there's a problem you know, with your identity meshing and becoming that that your team possesses. It's inexact. I can't quantify it. Some guys can do it. Some guys can't. I am not selling all my Billy Napier stock or anything like that. Um, I've told you, I never thought that his fate rested on the 2023 season, but they have missed, what, what is it, Jesse? They've missed Bulls three years in a row now, and it's the first time since like the, the Roosevelt administration, or maybe the Ben Franklin administration. Yeah, and Bradley is my resident presidential expert. Bradley, what was your favorite part of the Ben Franklin administration? So while he looks that up and gets no return on Google, let me return you to real life. They have got a murderer's row of a schedule next year. They have got uh, what needs to be a game-changing recruiting class coming in. I don't have a ton of confidence. I am the last person normally to punt on the future of a head coach. You know that about me. I am not the one. I'm not, this is not the show to come to if you want to hear me throwing coaches under a bus. A lot goes into it, and I know how hard it is to hire the right guy. And so I don't want you turning into Tennessee. Tennessee got themselves in a really big bind when they kept hiring and firing, hiring and firing, and they're only just now digging out of it. Uh, but Florida fans would look at that and say, no, 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 we're in that now. Three straight losing seasons. Haven't happened this, it hasn't happened since the 70s. That's when rumors came out. And that's a great album, but it's a really old album because that's a long time ago. Not good. Florida State, um, I think they're in the playoff with a win. And congratulations to them. We've got... We've got hires happening. I, I need to talk to you about these. And we've got more opening. We've got openings all over the place. I'm not just talking about head coaches. I'm talking about coordinator spots. The ripple effect is, is being felt far and wide in college football. So let me, first off, let me say hey to you guys. A lot of folks in the live chat tonight. So do me a favor. We already got over 1,000 of them. 
Uh, but if you'll just click that thumbs up button, because like one ninth of you have done that, that helps to keep the show free. And the other thing that helps to keep the show free is if you'll just subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening on podcast tomorrow, I'm talking to you Sunday night, just subscribe to it. That's all I need you to do. That's, that's it. Nothing else. Don't need you to buy anything or, you know, go sign up for a newsletter. Just subscribe. That's what helps our numbers and appreciate it in advance. Michigan State hired Jonathan Smith from Oregon State. Now, this was a move that had to happen for Smith. I mean, your program is fading from the Power Five landscape. It, it's, it sucks. It's out of their control. Uh, but yet, it, it also was time. You can't, you know, you, you can't go down with the ship if you're a guy who has a seat on potentially many other ships that are going to stay afloat in those waters. And so it's a good time. I thought it was a good time for a lot of these teams to be in the market for a new head coach. Cause think about the circumstances out West. It's like a, a perfect confluence of events, Michigan state or Mississippi state, or, or like a lot of these program A and M even you got programs that need head coaches and you got a lot of quality guys that you, whether it be Jonathan Smith or Mike Elko, Kalen DeBoer is at Washington. You don't know if he's available. Jed Fish is at Arizona. You don't know if he's available. But if you need a head coach, there's some really good coaches out there who aren't exactly superstars. So, in other words, they're attainable. And they got one at Michigan State. He was the 2022 Pac-12 Co-Head Coach of the Year. He was 18-7 and seven at Oregon State the past two seasons. Now, it took a while for them to build up to speed, because there is no built-in advantage in Corvallis, Oregon. He inherited a 1-11 and 11 team, and then it took four years, because he went 16-28 and 28 the first four years. I think the COVID years built in there, too. But eventually, he built them to a level of respectability, and then all of a sudden, they start beating teams they're not supposed to, and that's when everyone starts to take notice. I do not doubt that Michigan State's invested enough, too. So the big question with Smith will be, okay, he's coming all the way from the West Coast, he doesn't have familiarity. What staff is he going to bring in? Sounds like he's bringing a lot of his guys. They don't have uh, familiarity with the territory here. Well, to that I say, I'll grant you. Uh, good point. There's only one way to get it. Nick Saban didn't know anything about recruiting the South until he came to the South. I always use that. And then people say, are you saying Jonathan Smith's the next Nick Saban? As a matter of fact, I am not. I'm just using it as an example to say, you can't know something until you learn it. He knows football. Now, will he learn the, the ways of the Big Ten world? Hey, learn the ways of the portal world. Or has he already done that? They brought in seven guys this last cycle. He got Uyangalale up there and immediately plugged him in as a starting quarterback. Michigan State's invested resource-wise. So they, they're, they're going to be okay there. Like if, if he fulfills his end of the deal, they'll fulfill on the other end. But... You know, Michigan right now, I got a lot of their fans coming at me saying, you know why you picked Ohio State against us? And I'm like, yeah, I thought they'd win. And they said, nope, you thought they'd win because you pay too much attention to recruiting rankings, which I do pay a lot of attention to. And, and they may even be right about that. There may be some little, some little voice way back in my subconscious that if all things are equal, makes me lean towards the roster with the higher rated classes in recent history. Not the wildest accusation I've ever had hurled at me. Well, the funny thing is, Michigan is doing it the way they're doing it. And for all I know, Jonathan Smith's about to do the same thing. I doubt we'll see Michigan State parked in the top five of the 24-7 sports recruiting rankings in the near future. But I do think we'll see a very competitive product on the field for Michigan State in the near future, which will mean, again, organizations end up winning. It will mean he's built a strong organization there. And I've got confidence that he'll do it. Now, from one MSU to another MSU, and I'm going to get through this. I've got, I've got several more things to talk about. I've got, I've got several more games to talk about. Just a jam-packed show tonight. Jeff Lebby, did you know? Did anyone know? Yeah. Mississippi State has hired Jeff Lebby as the next head coach. Whomst? I know some of you don't watch every single down of every single game. So Jeff Lebby, offensive coordinator at Oklahoma. He was at Ole Miss before that. It's just evidence to me that Mississippi State and the powers that be over there, Zach Selman's a pretty new athletic director, they looked around and said, hold up. So we had Dan Mullen, who did things a certain way. And then we have Mike Leach, who, you know, broad strokes purposes, another offensive guy. And then we went Zach Arnett. And that 
sucked. And so let's go back to where we previously saw our bread buttered. Let's go get a guy who does things on the offensive side of the ball that makes people at least concerned and worried to play us on Saturday. And they did it. They got Jeff Levy, 39 years old, just led the number three offense in the country at Oklahoma this year, scored 65 three times this year. It's pretty good. Um, He knows the state of Mississippi. He's been there before. He was at Ole Miss. He knows the offense. He knows Lane Kiffin. I don't necessarily think they're the best of friends in the world. Interesting dynamic. Interesting dynamic that'll start to brew between Lane Kiffin and Jeff Lebby. And, hey, it just makes for exciting future Egg Bowls. Uh, It's allegedly a five-year deal. I believe Pete Thamel reported that. I don't know the particulars on that yet. But Mississippi State fans love it. I think Mississippi State fans have about as keen an awareness of their program per capita, as like any fan base in America, they're not sitting here asking who's going to win a national title at Mississippi State. Some of the fringe may be asking who's going to take us to Atlanta. By and large, they want to win two out of every three Egg Bowls in the perfect world, and they want to be respected. They want to be competitive, and they don't want Bama and LSU to look at them and say, Are we going to be able to rest starters in the second half? Are we going to be able to work on some things Saturday when we play state? No, man, it should it should be that you look at them, especially if you got to go to Starkville and say, here we go, Mississippi State week again. That's what they want. That's what they want. And I'll be very interested to see if Jeff Lebby can deliver that. I, a lot of the high school guys, a lot of the high school coaches especially, really like Jeff Lebby because that's who I heard from more than anyone today. High school guys said, I know a lot of these other hires are going to get more headlines. Jeff Lebby at Mississippi State just feels like a really good fit. There's that word again. That fit word. What fits at Mississippi State? Winning. That's what fits. Same thing as every program. Now, I know we're talking a lot about hires, and that's this time of year. Oh, by the way, almost spilled something down there. Um, So I know we're talking about hires, but sometimes it's not a hire that's happening this time of year. Oh, here it is, Colin. I was just just killing time because I was looking for my chapstick. It's very dry in the studio tonight. Jesse, get a humidifier for the studio, please. Or have management get it. He's got that um, that black credit card he carries around a lot. So we'll have him work on that. Okay, back to programming. Arkansas did not make a coaching change. Arkansas is retaining Sam Pittman. And Hunter Juracek uh, announced he's bringing him back before the last game even happened, and they proceeded to just lay down in the last game. And, and Missouri helped them lay down. So... Most Arkansas fans, as best I can tell, are against this. That's not always the end-all, be-all, but I'm, I'm just saying you're ultimately beholden to your fan base, and, and they've, in large quantities, come to decide Sam Pittman's no longer the right guy to lead the program. Now, I still believe in the concept. Okay, so the concept with Pittman always was, let's bring him in to be the face of the program, He's going to have to be a CEO type. He's going to have to have rock-solid coordinator hires. They need to be really dynamic at the offensive coordinator position. They need forward-thinking front office personnel. Their their NIL game needs to be on point. Their player personnel folks need to be very inventive and creative and, again, forward-thinking. And if they have that infrastructure, Sam Pittman can be a winner at Arkansas. Still believe that. Still believe that wholeheartedly, but they don't have it right now. Probably, and Arkansas fans would would tell you this in a second, ask them what the most troubling part of their team this year was. It's not just the losing. Arkansas's lost games before, they'll lose games in the future. It's not the losing, it's total ineptitude on the offensive line that is the specialty of your head coach. That's the most troubling part. Because it's totally fair to look and say, it, Sam Pittman, man, like, yeah, you got to hire coordinators and yeah, you got to have folks and you'll be the CEO type, but shouldn't at least our offensive line be dominant if we have you as our head coach? That is a valid criticism, totally valid criticism. And they look lifeless at the end of the year. Now, you know, I'm also a believer. There's only so much gas in a tank of a college football team in a season. But when they, when they had that three-point loss to Bama, Following that, uh, things, well, they, they beat Florida, but most people did this year. But, but following that, man, it was disappointing to watch them down the stretch. And it was disappointing all year to watch the offensive line. So 
that doesn't mean these aren't correctable things. Like I said, I still believe in the concept, but they are nose diving as a program right now, or so it seems. How often do we see a coach able to pull the nose up? It happens, but it's rare. Far more frequently, we see the nose dive begin. And then if you get a stay of execution, it carries over into next year, but the nose never gets pulled up. And the only difference is a coach gets four weeks into his next year and then gets fired. And the fan base is saying, but wait a minute, if we were going to, if we were that close to firing, him, why didn't we do it last season? And um, I don't have any real confidence either way about where this is going to go. Now, I, I, I will tell you, Aranda's the same way at Baylor. If you're nice and folks like you, it is the difference in a 50-50 coin flip situation in getting yourself another year versus getting fired. Holgerson got fired at Houston. Not many people like him. Uh, Pittman did not get fired at Arkansas. Folks like him. Aranda got another year at Baylor. Folks like him. It pays to be nice. That's why me and Colin are two of the nicest people that you will ever meet. We go out of our way to talk to folks. We're always the center of a room. We love social interaction. And that's because we know if it really comes down to it, we'll, we'll, we'll get the benefit of the doubt around here. And we do. It works for Director Colin and I. So, you know, if, if you see Director Colin and I, the next thing you'll be doing is shaking our hand and then talking our ear off because we just love it. Don't we, Colin? He's just wagging the, the camera up and down. Yes, we love that. So um, I don't know what's going to happen, guy. I wish I had a more definitive take here. I don't have a great feel about where the future of the Arkansas program is. I just hope I'm wrong. I guess I just hope I'm wrong. They're watching us in Columbia, Missouri, Rome, Georgia, Colorado Springs, Colorado is tuned in. Let's talk about some good old-fashioned intel here. Who else is making a coaching change? Baylor's not. Baylor is sticking with Dave Aranda. I just told you, I think being a nice guy pays off if it's a coin flip situation. I also think folks at Baylor do remember we won the Big 12 two years ago. Like we won the Sugar Bowl two years ago. This is Baylor. A guy who pulls that off clearly knows football. It's just that when things get wobbly at Alabama, Nick Saban can just make all the moves in one offseason. You don't necessarily possess that powerful a weapon as a head coach at Baylor. So if things get wobbly, like Aranda's admitted happened with his reluctance to, you know, embrace the portal, you don't just all of a sudden say, oh, don't worry, I'll just go finish with the number one class next cycle. That's not Baylor. And so I think he got himself another year because of recent success. Uh, I think there'll be tons of staff moves here, but... I love, I love Dave Aranda, so I'm pulling for him. I am very biased on this front. I hoped he would get another year. We told you a couple of weeks ago, unless there's disaster the last two weeks, he's going to be retained. There wasn't disaster. He got retained, and that's what's happening right now at Baylor. Now, as for Houston, that is not the story. Dana Holgerson has been fired, told you a couple of weeks ago, right after we did the Aranda update. I told you I was hearing he needed two wins to close the season or he was done. And they lost to Oklahoma State, and they lost to UCF, and he was done. Um, It's a different caliber program now that Houston's in the Big 12, and it demands a different caliber head coach. I think a lot of people around the Houston program, although they would never admit it publicly, did not mind losing those last two games if it meant taking one step forward for the perceived five steps, or one step backwards for the perceived five steps forward they think they're going to make. Depends on who they hire. And I think the usual suspects are going to be right at the forefront of this job search. Uh, Trailer up at UTSA didn't get the A&M job. He could be in the mix here. Willie Fritz at Tulane almost had the Georgia Tech job last year. I think they fumbled that. Now, uh, look, Brent Key is doing all right. So they're good at Georgia Tech. Uh, Gary Patterson is, is allegedly in play here. Cliff Kingsbury. That's some names being thrown around by the Houston Chronicle. I happen to think if my job was open at the power five level or whatever we're calling that now, if my job's open and I'm in a major conference and Willie Fritz is just sitting there winning at Tulane, I'm going to get him. He's going to be my head coach or I'm going to make him tell me no. And then if he tells me no, I'll go elsewhere. But um, man, Willie Fritz is the real deal. 
And I would consider it a blessing that Georgia Tech didn't close the deal on them last year. And if I'm Houston, that's who I'd be calling. You're not going to go wrong with Jeff Trailer. I am not, I'm not poo-pooing any other of those names. But I am telling you, Willie Fritz is pretty high on my list. Tom Allen got fired at Indiana today after a 3-9 and nine season. He's had seven seasons there, one winning season. None of these things are what stand out. What stands out is he's got a $20 million buyout. Saw some folks on uh, the internet earlier today start tr- trying to figure out the math here. It's like, wait a second. So if, if we can pay $20 million in buyout, how can we not just afford to have the best NIL program in college football? Like if we, f- if we have that kind of money, why don't we redirect it in however manner we need to? And, and why don't we just spend a ton of money on football players and become good? No, simpleton, they would tell you. No, 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 it's not that easy. And they'd pat you on the head. And all the while, you're right. It does check out. But you have too much common sense for college football on the administrative side. That's like, that's like you know, walking in front of Congress and saying, guys, we're spending more money than we actually have. If I did that, they would kick me out of my apartment. You do that, and you guys just get another term. How does this work? They would look at you and say, no, 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 no. Go back, Mr. Mechanic. Go back, Mr. Fast Food Worker. You're not qualified to think on these lines. Actually, I don't think you guys are because you're the ones running up the deficit. And it's the same way in college football. Instead of investing properly in building a winning college football program, we're just going to go pay tens of millions of dollars for guys not to coach. And somehow it makes sense. Well, actually, it doesn't. It's just you and I aren't supposed to be able to figure that out. And yet somehow we do. Remember, uh, remember this past hiring cycle. Nebraska made a move and they upgraded big time in terms of name. They went and got Matt Rule. Wisconsin had an opening and they upgraded big time in terms of name. They went and got Luke Fickle. Michigan State just had an opening. Got one of the best available in Jonathan Smith. Now Indiana's got an opening. I have a working theory that with the infusion of TV money, with the latest media rights deal into this conference, there is an unspoken or perhaps a behind-the-scenes spoken understanding that you guys are not going to hire mid-head coaches anymore. You're going to go spend top dollar because we're giving you money. You're going to go spend top dollar. You're going to invest and hire major head coaches like they've done in the South forever. They're not all going to work out. Keep spending money and keep hiring the best possible available until you get it right because we don't want to look at a two-team or a three-team conference because we just spent billions of dollars to broadcast it. Now, as you know, I work for CBS, so I have a vested interest in the future in the Big Ten being good. Do I have bias? Yes, I do. I would love for Indiana to be good. I'd love for Purdue to be good. I would love it, love it, love it. So am I playing favorites? Yes, I am. Naturally, growing up in Harris County, Georgia, I was a Big Ten homer, and they will accuse me of that until the day I die. Oklahoma has an offensive coordinator opening now, by the way. Penn State has an offensive coordinator opening. USC still has a defensive coordinator opening, and if that hasn't been filled since I've been on air, that's interesting because I thought that thing would be filled already. Let's talk about some more games here, shall we? I've also got a best bet. There's a game I like. There's a game the model really likes in conference championship action this week. So we'll get to all that, and um, then we'll get out of here. But I told you, jam-packed show, and I was not lying. Funny thing about losing your voice. Once you get your voice back, you really want to use it a whole lot. Oregon beat Oregon State the other night. It's, I think, a Friday game. So that's old news now. But it was the November theory. It is sometimes if teams out of gas, they're not going to fill the tank in November. And if a team is surging, uh, Vegas cannot set a number high enough for me not to bet on that favorite. And Oregon fit that description. Uh, Wide receivers one and two, 11 catches for 137, nine catches for 128. It was a terrible matchup for Oregon State. So Oregon State obviously had 12 plus weeks of gas. They've got the Pac-12 championship game coming up on Friday. I just... You talk about padlock. Padlock stat here is the drive chart for Oregon State. They had a turnover on downs. They punted. They scored a touchdown. They kneeled to end the half. 
turnover on downs, punt, interception, turnover on downs, turnover on downs in the football game. That's a recipe for a blowout loss. Ducks are headed to Vegas. Next up, this just happened last night, and I was also in Detroit International Airport watching this unfold. Washington gets pushed to the limit by Washington State. It was a Ramen Noodle Express special. Um, Washington was outgained. Jesse, is that right? Washington got outgained 381 to 306. Yes. Not that that's the end all be all. Just an interesting little note there. So Washington's had this run now. They've been on eight games in a row. They've won, but they've won by 10 points or fewer. Seven of those eight have been one possession games. And I've noticed something happening. See, we were ahead of the curve here at the JP poll about labeling Washington maybe as not quite to the degree or, or at the level that Oregon is, even though they beat Oregon early in the year. And they're not on Georgia's level. I don't think that they're on Texas's level. I don't think they're on Alabama's level. But they're undefeated. They're winning all their games. And what I've noticed over about the past two weeks is I have started to defend Washington against some of my more ill-informed brethren in the I, Josh, because of the recalibration of expectation. It's a theory that we have on this show. The recalibration of expectation is when you don't expect something from a team, like for them to compete for a playoff spot, for example. Then they start competing for the playoff spot, which means right then and there, what you should do is just label yourself wrong. Like I had them ranked in the, I had them rated in the 18 to 22 range preseason. Well, I was wrong about Washington. That's it. But a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people don't say they're wrong. Instead, what they do is they recalibrate their expectations. Then they start holding you to a higher standard. And then once you don't meet that standard, then they start slamming you. Here's what that sounds like. Yeah, Washington's undefeated, but they're just barely winning these games. That's not a bad thing. It's a wonderful thing. They're undefeated is the point. They're, they're 11, they're 12 and 0. They're going to the Pac-12 championship game. If they win, they're a playoff team. It's Washington, man. You don't sit there and say, well, they're not as impressive as Georgia. I know that. You know that. And everyone knows that. It's Washington. So credit Kalen DeBoer and his team. You win by one point or a thousand. You guys are undefeated. And if you win Friday night, then you're in the dance. And who knows where I'll be Friday night. We'll see. Oklahoma State trailed 24-6 to yesterday. Yet again, another game I'm watching unfold in Detroit's airport. Good Wi-Fi in Detroit. They're down 24-6. to And then they're not. And they win 40-34 to in, I believe, double overtime. They scored touchdowns on four of their final five possessions, did the Oklahoma State Cowboys. And uh, as you can imagine, if you watch this show or you've listened to this show for a long time, you know that I took our flag as a people, as, as Pate State. I took our flag, and in the preseason, I just planted that thing. And on that flag, it said, Big 12 championship prediction. And you know what? Don't even take my word for it now. Colin's got a special piece of video. Let's go all the way back to August and see what I said. Conference championship, I'm taking Texas, but I'm taking them over Oklahoma State, a team I think is going to come out of nowhere and surprise people this year after they fell off a cliff last year. Let me first start with the Cowboys. So Mike Gundy's really good, and Mike Gundy knows what he's doing, and it looks like his roster got gutted by the transfer portal. I think it's one of the bigger illusions right now in the Big 12. I think they added some good pieces too, extremely underrated on the defensive line. I would implore them to figure out the quarterback position, but I think they will, and I think there's a level of play that I'll get at the quarterback position out of them that's going to have them right in the thick of things. And the other thing you need to keep in mind is their schedule is insanely workable. I want you to think about the sentence that's about to come out of my mouth. Oklahoma State plays in the Big 12. They play one team in the state of Texas the entire year. And it's Houston. And it was a good year to be facing Houston as your one Texas team. Breaking news, friends. Texas versus Oklahoma State in the Big 12 championship game. Hey, being right is not everything to me. 
being right when people call me out is what is everything to me. And believe it or not, when I predicted Oklahoma State to go to the Big 12 championship game in August, some people couldn't help themselves. And they made a mistake. One, the mistake was calling us out. They didn't call me out. They called us out. Uh, But that wasn't the mistake. The second mistake they made was they didn't delete the tweets. And when this happened, I screenshot every one of those tweets. I didn't say a word in August. I did not say a peep. I put my prediction out there. People ran their mouths. And I did nothing publicly, but I screenshot every single one of them. That's the past tense of screenshot, by the way. Colin, let's just roll through them, my friend. I have a mountain of these. So you guys could have our own special just doing this. Quote, you know what Oklahoma has coming in and returning? And you pick Oklahoma State over them. Yeah, all right. I did. Yeah, all right. Next up, Colin. This is so fun. Uh, We had our buddy Max say, I didn't realize you were so thirsty for engagement. You know, by the way, friends, this is not Mac talking. This is me talking. Did you know that anytime someone says something you disagree with, it's clickbait? Anytime someone says something you disagree with, it can't be that your opinion is flawed. It must be that they're trafficking in engagement tactics, you know, engagement farming, as they say. Hey, alternate point of view here. I could just really believe what I say, and you disagree with it. Could be. Anyway, Matt continues. Oklahoma State is not going to the Big 12 Championship. Easy schedule or not, they lost eight starters to the transfer portal. The defensive coordinator questions? They've been to one Big 12 championship ever. Who is their quarterback? Well, uh, I spoke on the quarterback situation. They figured it out. You talked about the starters they lost. You didn't speak about the ones who were actually going to play this year. It's so funny how people are ready to down a prediction in August. Knowing full well in this sport, every year unpredictable things happen. Without fail. And so, Mac, I will be waiting my apology Monday, Tuesday, at any point this week, just leading up to the game. Let's roll on, Colin. Uh, for some friendly fire here, uh, one, of our, one of our comrades at CBS Sports said, I don't know if these picks are a bit, because I couldn't come up with a bit this good if I tried. Well, just because you couldn't come up with one that good doesn't mean the rest of us couldn't, or maybe, just maybe the rest of us were right. Maybe this is a bit. Maybe calling out people for predictions that end up coming to fruition is the bit all along. He continues, Oklahoma State is so far off the board that we're in a different zip code. But I live in the right zip code, and you're free to join me. we got plenty of room over here. Let's roll it on, Colin. Should we continue? Yes, we should. Quote, come on, man, Oklahoma State? Have you not seen they lost their whole team and they brought in scrubs? Do you make these choices with a dartboard? If I do... I'm really good at darts. I could continue. We got a million of them. I could continue. But you get the point. It's it's a tough thing to wait four months and just silently sit there like the little raccoon rubbing his hands together awaiting the Big 12 championship game. But now we have it. And Oklahoma State's about a two-touchdown underdog. But now we have it. This Saturday in Arlington, Texas. Speaking of Texas... Uh, they just splattered Texas Tech 57 to 7. Their hump was in Ames, Iowa. The, the hump they needed to get over as a team, it wasn't Texas Tech. We, we took them with confidence in the Ramen Noodle Express. We took the Longhorns. That wasn't going to be a problem. The, the, the Iowa State game was the potential trip up. They got past that one, they rolled past Texas Tech. They, like I said, 13 and a half point favorites, Texas against Oklahoma State this Saturday. Uh, good for Clemson, man. They beat South Carolina 16-7 to yesterday. Didn't even need an offensive touchdown. Padlock stat. Outrushed South Carolina 219-57. to The run game is a glaring issue for South Carolina. It was all year. They've got to get that thing corrected. They Whatever moves you got to make, portal, staff, they got to make moves or else it'll be more of the same next year. Uh, just quickly, and I got a best bet to get you and we got to get out of here. Quickly. This time of year, it's either about teams that are in the playoff or teams that are terrible, and we forget, like, Alex Golish is taking South Florida to a bowl. Barry Odom has got UNLV playing in the conference championship game out in the Mountain West. Notre Dame went 9-3. and three. Good year for Marcus Freeman. Missouri just went 10-2 and two 
under Eli Drinkwitz, and their losses were to LSU in Georgia. I mean, Kiffin at Ole Miss, again, has a 10-win season. You know who their two losses were to? Bama and Georgia, the two teams that will play for a conference title this Saturday. Penn State, they lost the two games that were the most important games, but elsewhere, they took care of business. So what does that make them? It makes them a really good program that thus far can't get past elite programs. Still, a lot further you could fall than you could climb in that position. Arizona, Jed Fish, probably head coach of the year this year. And if he gets it, he deserves it. Nine and three season at Arizona with a team that had a preseason over-under win total of 4.5 wins. Huge congratulations to Jed Fish and his staff out there. Doran at NC State finishes 9-3. and three. I mean, one of the most slept-on teams this year. I include us in that description because we didn't talk about NC State a lot. But they, fin- they finished with five straight wins, uh, beat North Carolina as a slight underdog. They were on the Ramen Noodle Express yesterday. Another winning Saturday for the Ramen Noodle Express. So congratulations to all of you guys. We got conference championship games this weekend. You know, you know the place, if you have confidence, to wager on them is FanDuel. We're doing it responsibly or we're not doing it at all. We all agreed on that, right? You're not betting money you don't have. You're not betting your parents' money or anyone else's money. Get your own allowance. You know, get your own job. And, uh, you know, instead of spending $13.50 for a movie ticket, just place it on, you know, maybe like SMU or, or maybe UNLV or maybe Georgia. FanDuel has you set up. They are our exclusive betting odds provider. And just as sure as I'm about to give you a best bet uh, that actually is available on FanDuel because I bet it earlier today myself, you go there, $5 on any money line. Any money line. If that thing wins, you get $150 in bonus cash. I'm told that producer Jesse went home this week and, and actually hooked a family member up. Now, we don't get family member discounts here, but that is a discount. 150 bucks if you hit a $5 money line is a discount. And if you want the rules to that, if you want the link to that, it's in the show description right now on YouTube. Just, just look right below the video and you'll find it. Appreciate FanDuel. Uh, some very fun things I think we'll have with them next year. And we're about to get in bowl season too, so we'll have a lot of fun things before the season ends. I've got a Ramen Noodle Express early best bet for you. We've got conference championships this week. We're going to be breaking them down Tuesday night, but Ramen Noodle Express brought to you by FanDuel. I got an early game that I jumped on today, and I want to do one thing, Jesse. I want to pull up an odds board because we have been on the air, frankly, an irresponsible amount of time, and so odds could have moved, and I just want to make sure that they did not. All right, there they are. Yes, we are taking SMU. They're playing Tulane in the conference championship game. We're taking SMU plus four and a half. The model thinks that has a 63.7% cover probability. So Rhett Lashley, you already had pressure on you this weekend, my friend, but there is no pressure like being on the Ramen Noodle Express during conference championship week. And I wish you, I wish you all the luck in the world. But as we, as we learned from Billy Zane and Titanic, a real man makes his own luck. Happy to have you guys tonight. Really big audience. We do this show all year. It's free all year. All all I need you to do is subscribe to the channel. Podcast, subscribe to the podcast. I'm going to be in Atlanta this Saturday for the SEC championship game right there on the sideline. And uh, Friday, look, hey, we may make a surprise appearance Friday as well, several states away. So it's going to be a very active week. Uh, Make sure you guys are locked in. We got to finish. We got to finish strong. For producer Jesse, director Colin, I'm Josh Pate. Take care. Have a great start to your week, and God bless.